Welcome, 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 geeks and nerds, girls and boys, to a brand new edition of Geek to Me Radio, episode 201. Today we are joined by actor June Carroll talking about her work as Dr. Louise Hastings in Hulu's Marvel's Hellstrom series. We'll also talk to New York Times best-selling author Craig Allenson all about his new book and his series. All that and more, stand by. We're talking to And for those of you tuning in for the first time, welcome to geek to me Radio. This is the 201st episode, so you're going to have a lot of catching up to do if you're brand new. For those of you who have been around for the long haul, we appreciate your listening. Make sure you're following us on Twitter and Instagram at geek to me Radio. Check out the Facebook page, facebook.com slash geek to me Radio, where you can keep up with all the other stuff we're doing. So these next couple of shows are a little bit backdated. Uh, these were interviews that I had done back in mid-December. And just with the holidays and the hustle and bustle and everything going on, I am just now airing them. So my apologies to my guests for not getting these out sooner. Uh, but it's just one of those things. Sometimes we struggle. We get stuff done, though. We've got a lot of great shows coming is what that means. And we're going to kick it off right now with our first guest. Right now we're talking to actor June Carroll all about... Marvel's Hellstrom on Hulu, in addition to her many other acting credits she has under her belt. June, how are you? I am doing really well, thank you. Doing Good. Doing really well. Are you doing okay? Yeah. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. It's 2020, so you never know, though. It's 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 a weird yeah. year. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> but you've stayed busy. Uh, you've got a lot going on. And, of course, Marvel's Hellstrom. Uh, it's always fun to be part of the these comic book worlds that we see so much movie and television content uh, being written for these characters. Were you a comic book fan growing up? I was, actually. I was in love with X-Men. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, Wolverine, in particular, was my dude. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was to be all these years later, you know, it's like, oh, my goodness, I have in that <laughs> universe. What? It was crazy. It was crazy when they when it said yes. And a lot of these these great content the the streaming services like Hulu and other streaming services mm-hmm. are providing it's uh it's it I would assume it's a great time to be an actor in your profession who's got uh all these cool projects out there on the horizon was this something uh the the audition process was a, an arduous thing was it a very simple audition process if you would talk a little bit about how you got the gig for Louis Hastings Sure it was actually a relatively simple if mysterious uh, audition process. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got a script from uh, my uh, agent, and there was all this hush hush. Don't tell her. Don't talk about it. We can't tell you what the name of it is. Um, you know, and it was what I under, I understood. I was made to understand that it's a basically a mock up. It's not the script itself. It's just a an idea for what kind of so that they could get an idea of your fit into this world. Um, did our first audition with, I'm trying to remember, oh no, that's right. It was, yeah, it was with Lorray, um, who was amazing with Lorray and Lisa. And, um, I don't know. We just came, came into a room. Uh, wait, I can't, I'm not wow. It's, it's actually starting to, to, <laughs> to get away from me a little. It's all mashing together. Um, that's right. The first was actually a recorded audition. That's right. I, recorded the first, sent that in, then got a call back. That's right. And the call back was um with uh Lorraine and Lisa greeting us and then Paul, Megan and um uh Jeff in the room. 
And we just did the same sides, uh, got a little bit of direction, and uh, then went away and didn't hear anything and until, like, I think it was like a couple weeks later. Yeah, it was like about 10 days uh, later. I get this uh, call from uh, Jeff, and he says, I'd like to welcome you to the Marvel Universe. I mean, wow. I was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so it was yeah. that, when he said that, was that the first time you knew it was for a specific Marvel project? Um, I... I kind of knew because we knew that it was, we knew it was Marvel. We okay. just didn't know anything about the product. It was just, it's, so it was like, it was, but it wasn't until like part two, audition number two that I was like, oh, this is Marvel. Oh, okay. Cool. 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 <laughs> but you know, you don't think about it. You're just like, oh, that's neat. I got into this room. That's all you think, you know? Right. And, so you you and it's also it's Marvel, so you don't think um you don't dare think anything beyond how cool is that <laughs> <laughs> you just don't go there, you just can't <laughs> and then your mind's obviously always raising, oh, are we gonna get to cross over? am I gonna get to you know work on set with you know Tom Holland or someone like that, or is there gonna right. be any crossovers because they 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 haven't done as much t v and movie crossovers as I would like to see personally. Uh, but it's always I, that's got to be in the back of your mind. It's like now that Disney's kind of bringing everything together, and you know, I, mm-hmm. it's uh, have, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that'd be kind of cool. I would not be, I would not be mad. Yeah, and now and you're playing. Then, then your mind starts to race. <laughs> exactly, exactly right. And you're playing a psychiatrist. Uh, so yes. when you're playing this kind of a character, did was there a backstory? Was there a showrunner's bible they gave you to kind of, or did you do research on your own? Is it just research on psychology itself kind of talk a little bit about how you got into the mindset for Dr. Louise Hastings. Sure. Um, first I ran down what little I could about her in the Marvel universe, because there is a, uh, Dr. Louise, uh, in, in Hastings, not in, not directly in the Hellstrom world, but in a uh, sort of parallel mm-hmm. world. And, um, you know, I got as much as I could from that. But he, honestly, I didn't want to get too caught up in that story because I knew that they were, I was more an Easter egg than the actual, what was manifested in the, 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 the comics, right. comic book series. So once I had sort of where she had come from, what her little origin, what her origin story was, I then went and studied everything I could about um, Catholicism because her background is actually in religion. Mm. And then uh, psychology tried to sort of, and how she might have transitioned from uh, religion to psychology. Um, I built a biography for her based on, I mean, you know, Wiki is your friend. So, (laughs) um, yeah, so I just kind of ran down everything I could about Specifically, uh, the um, concept of uh, Saint Teresa, who is the saint patron saint of the afflicted, and um, because it just seemed they were really smart. Paul is uh, uh, really uh, Paul is really smart about symbolism, and so you know that my character would be drawn to parapsychology. Just, I don't know. There was just something so smart about it that I just got fascinated with it and just ran with that. Um, and then after that, you just build on what's in the, in the script in front of you. And with one like this, you, you've got, you know, several episodes to play out the character over with, it sounds like you do like a good deal of research. You really kind of uh, delve into the character, the psyche when you're doing, uh, you, cause we've seen you in some other fantastic shows like dead to me, which is a brilliant show. Yeah. Uh, you were in lethal yeah. weapon, which I was so sorry to see that show got canceled. So when, yeah. when you're doing these other shows where it's kind of like lethal weapon, if I'm not mistaken, you were a judge in one of those episodes was, yes. do you do yes. any kind of a, a deep dive as far as the like the law profession or anything like that or is it pretty much with the, with when you're doing a single episode guest appearance is it just kind of taking on the page and some director's notes uh a little closer to that uh, again it depends on the it depends on the character when you do enough um judges or lawyers 
you kind of you, you kind of have a, a, a store of information and then it just okay, are there any precedents that I need to know about? Are there any is there anything to this character's mindset with regard to blah blah blah. Um but you know, I kind of have developed and plus I studied uh political science and a little bit of law in That's right, college. Yeah. So, you know, I had a good deal of that in my back pocket. Um I think when it comes to playing psychiatrists and psychologists, I want to get into their specialty. Okay. Um, so I will do some deep dives into, you know, child psychology or, um, you know, uh, various pathologies, just so that I no, just so that I know, just to have it for myself, because it actually does add dimension to the character. Nobody's sure. ever going to know. Oh, she knows what the DSMV is. But <laughs> nobody, nobody, nobody knows. Nobody, nobody cares. But I know that I know, and I think it it lends my um, work a little more specificity, which makes me feel really good. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And talking about yeah. you mentioned your degree in political science, you were were going for that, and I, I don't know if I'd call it a one eighty, but. Uh, I, I find it. I find it funny because honestly, I can relate to this because one of my degrees is political science, and I ended up yeah. doing nothing with it. I've, I'm now in radio, no, so it, it's kind all. of funny. And there's so many other political science, like some of the people I keep up with, alumni from my college, are like, "Yeah, dude, no, I'm doing finance right now." So it's just kind of funny yeah. that that it seems like political science is one that people quickly are like. Nah, it's nice to have, but not really. So, what was the mindset that you decided to change and go the complete other direction with English lit, if I'm not mistaken? Right. Well, part of it was was I was sit, <laughs> sitting in graduation, and uh, I was sitting across from my teammate Alex Lee, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and we both had the same sort of large, large eyes. <laughs> got it out later, and we're like, "Who were all those other people?" <laughs> Neither of us knew who anybody else was in the department. So I had had the little bug in the back of my brain. Okay, June, you're not getting. Um, uh, apprenticeships you're not applying for legal this that, and the other you're just not doing it then the last round of lsat came along and i was like nope i'm sleeping through them that's the worst and test in realized, the world who is the lsat i i took it twice i'm like nope i, I don't want to do this anymore <laughs> no no see but you you, you did better than me because i didn't even go oh well, <laughs> you saved yourself ahead like, no, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> yeah and I just realized that enough of the my classmates were coming back from law school, their first year in law school, miserable, that I was like, look, oh, no. And there was one other thing. I took a uh, product liability class course in my senior year, and I got a triple A plus on my mock legal brief. Hmm. I wrote the legal brief based on an episode of L.A. Law about huh. – uh, I hope it's okay to say this um, – Product liability with regard to faulty bull semen that produced bad cows. Okay, that yeah, that's I got fine. an A plus on that. <laughs> wow, it told me two things. I am really good at making what I will of the truth. I.e., I'm a good liar, <laughs> and I don't want to lie for a living. Not if it's going to hurt people. And so, you know, I was casting about looking for answers, looking for answers. And I knew one thing that I'd always wanted to do was just speak. And so I started taking English lit classes and I figured English literature was, it was a way to invest myself in stories where people didn't get hurt and hmm. getting uh, drafted into a playwriting course because I wrote a play for my English survey course midterm, my theater uh, survey course midterm. That was the first time that I was able to tell a story, weave a yarn that I felt had a positive impact on the world. Hmm. I mean, it was, you know, it made my, I think it made my teacher just tickle there. And huh. then all of a sudden I figured out you can talk about the world like you do in political science. You can talk about consequences in the world that are the result of behavior and also what people do with language and that language is an incredibly powerful thing. So when I realized language is that powerful, I thought, this is what I need to be doing. I need to be telling stories, but I need to be telling stories that empower and that change the world in a good way. 
And that was, you know, it has taken decades to get to the place where my skill is um, developing to a point where I'm happy with it. But I'm, I, I, I'm so glad that I took this route because acting and theater and playwriting, they are my way of making a difference and talking and talking about the world and how I am affected by the world and how I move through the world. But they, I can do it in a way that's of value. Hmm. That's actually like, that's very profound. Actually. <laughs> I, I just, I'm sitting here <laughs> listening to you. It's like, wow, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah, and you've, you've kept up, you, you still write plays and everything like that. You've, uh, you've uh, written do. a screenplay as well, but so as, yeah. as an actor versus the writer, I almost feel like in a sense, you're kind of using two different parts of your brain. Are you able yeah. to shut off the writer's part of your brain when you're reading another script and acting, or is that little kind of nagging voice in the back of your head saying, well, I'd probably change this. And well, I don't know if this would say that, or, uh, or are you able to separate the two worlds? Um, I'm not good at separating the two worlds yet, but I'm good at, um, saying this is my job. My job is not to, my job is not when I'm acting, my job is not to change somebody else's words. I will ask for what I think I need, but if the writer slash director don't see it that way, I'm like, cool. Cause that's not my job. Yeah. My, my lane is to express what this writer had in mind. So while the editor does not ever stop, um, I'm able to still her and just do the work. And talking about another project you've worked on, I, if I'm not mistaken, I, again, I was kind of looking over it late last night, your IMDb resume, your first yeah. feature film role was what dreams may come uh, yeah. with Robin Williams, which I one, yeah. one, one of four celebrity deaths where I actually wept openly when I found out he'd passed. Yep. Uh, what an incredible talent. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, to be, have that movie, which is, gorgeous cinematography well acted be your first feature film role talk a little bit if you could about your experience on that we're gonna pause right there take our first commercial break come back and talk more with june carroll so please stand by my mind holds the key Hey, this is Mark Pellegrino, Lucifer from Supernatural, and you are listening to geek to me Radio. Welcome back to geek to me Radio. We're talking with actor June Carroll all about her various roles in many great projects. Uh, we were talking about Marvel's Hellstrom series on Hulu, and of course, we talked about working with the great Robin Williams on What Dreams May Come and what her experience was like with that. You know, it's still kind of blows my mind, honestly. Um, the sets, you know, they would let us come and see some of the sets and they were just, they were nothing short of miraculous. Hmm. What they were able to do, you know, like when Max and Side, I was in the, um, the, 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 the library. Yeah. Yeah. Just the scale of it. Carry, just carried you somewhere. And so, you know, I had, I got two jobs on that show. And the first was the girl who, because of whom Robin Williams ends up in the um, other realm. Mm -hmm. And so I, all you can see is my jaw. I don't care though, because the scene was with Robin Williams. And so we got, I got to watch him be. And he worked so hard to make everybody around him feel comfortable and happy. And you knew that that was a very sad, there was a sadness to him, Mm. but he worked so hard to make other people feel happy and welcome. And so that was kind of heartbreaking, but it also just showed you how much heart he had. And so that was amazing. And then I ended up being sort of one of the spirits in the water when he first got falls out of the boat. Okay. Yeah. And so it's him and Cuba Gooding Jr. And I think I just, I spent the whole time going, I can't believe I get to do this mm. with these people. Yeah. And they don't know who am I? I'm like, you know, <laughs> same from the left, but the experience for that to be my, and Oh, and then also the director was incredibly kind to me, you know, yeah. When we did this, the, the, the car crash scene, he was like, oh, 
he just said something really kind. And it was like, I, he, it was like, this person sees me. I'm a blip. This person actually sees me. Huh. And I just thought, this is the best introduction to what I want to do that anyone could have ever had. And so many other great roles. I mean, like I said, you've been, you've been in so many fantastic TV shows. Uh, we mentioned Dead to Me and Lethal Weapon, but Scandal. Uh, you're on Grey's Anatomy. You're on Mindhunter. Do you have, let's let's push Hellstrom to the side, obviously, for now. Uh, of your shows that you've been on, let's just say you've maybe been on one episode of a show, but if yeah. you had to pick like a favorite, either be it uh, just a really great experience with the cast and the crew or just a memorable time you had filming, do you have a favorite TV show on which you've been other than Hellstrom? I would have to say Mindhunter. Um, I was challenged um, to be honest in a way that I didn't know one could be. You know, David Fincher is, he repeats things for a reason. Mm. And you every time he's right he you know we 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 did a scene and then we did it again and we did it again and we did it again and he would just come over and like he creates this incredibly safe space for the actors and no matter what's going on outside you're in this amazing little comfortable little bubble where all you have to do is say the words and mean what you say um and the only thing i can liken it to is my experience on stage doing cabaret with this director, Mike Matthews, who is brilliant. But he, the, the thing that the two of them have in common is this um, awareness of when you're not bringing it, by which I mean when you're not being honest with hmm. yourself. If you're honest with yourself, then you'll give an honest performance. And all they ask is that you give yourself. And so to get to keep searching until I found myself, that was a gift. It just, it changed me as an actor, I think. It, it changed me as an actor because your gauge can be off. Yeah. And you can be talking with your head, not your heart. And the two have to kind of work together because, yes, there are the lines. Yes, there's the objective. Yes, there's all the, you know, super objective, all of that stuff. Absolutely. But if you're not talking at it through you, Ava Fincher can see that. And you're going, how come this man, what does this, this, this man got, to, got looking in my life? How are you going to look at my life? But he does. He really sees you. He really sees you. And that's why he just asks you to be honest. So yeah, that's a long-winded answer, but it's it's just that's how much language it takes to pay tribute to what I got out of the Mind Hunter experience. Hmm. And of course, uh, we're talking. We want to make sure you check out Hellstrom on Hulu, uh, yeah. where you can see June as Dr. Louise Hastings. What else do you have coming up? Any other projects that we can keep an eye on you for? I know 2020 has been a weird year for filming, but yeah. uh, filming is still going yeah. on. Some people have some stuff that they work on early in 2020 that's just now going to be coming out in 2021. Any projects which we can look for you in? Um, it's actually a, a theater project. I mean, I wrote a play about uh, what's happened in Zimbabwe in 2017, and I was just connected with an incredible director in Zimbabwe, and we are deciding, we're, we're in the early stages of producing this in Zimbabwe. There's oh, wow. also a feature that I'm co-directing um, written by McCall Sinnott, which is going to, I think we're talking uh, February, March. So yeah, there are a couple of things. Um, Born That Way is a film that will come out. It'll be released probably in 2022, but that's what I'm you know, you know directing. And uh, The Good Minister from Harare we're going to do a, we're going to do an online part of it. So look for that too. Very cool. And people want to keep up with you and keep up on those projects. Are Where, where are, is the best place for people to look for you? Social media, Twitter, Instagram, a website? Uh, Instagram. I'm always yelling on Instagram. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Is it, it just just your name on Instagram, or is it the June Carroll or anything like it's that? A, uh, it's a June Carroll. It's June Carroll. And yeah, uh, I post uh, projects that I'm um, involved with there, <laughs> and I yell a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's what social media is supposed to be cathartic. I think in 2020, <laughs> you should be allowed to yell as much as you want. That's my opinion. There we go. <laughs> Well, it's been, it, this has been a lot of fun talking to you. Just an amazing talent. You've got so many great projects of which you should be proud. Uh, so we'll watch Hellstrom on Hulu. We'll keep up. We'll watch for the rest of your projects coming out. And uh, happy new year. Happy holidays. Good luck thank to you, you in 2021. June Carroll, thanks so much. Yeah, man. Same to you. Thank you. Anytime. We're going to pause right there, take our next commercial break. We'll come back talking with New York Times bestselling author Craig Allenson. So stand by. Hey, this is Dave Desmalchin. You're listening to Geek to Me Radio. Welcome back to Geek to Me Radio. This segment brought to you by Marcus Theaters. MarcusTheaters.com is the website. Marcus Theaters and Movie Tavern, uh, making it safe to go back and see movies with all the procedures they've implemented, uh, the super cleaning they've done. They've raised it above the standards for what they need to have just to make sure your experience is safe, the people working are safe. But I missed movies during the pandemic probably more than anything else, and it's great to have them back, even in limited capacity. If you're wanting to get back out, check out MarcusTheaters.com uh, for the location closest to you, be it a Marcus Theaters or movie tavern see what's playing get out and see a movie support these theaters because when these places are gone people you're gonna wish you'd gone more you'd wish you, you know what it felt like in uh, march and april here in the states when everything shut down we're like oh no i can't see movies it's one of the things you sometimes take for granted so get out there see a movie i love the experience marcus theaters makes it great you can download the app the marcus theaters app and you can order your concessions right there in line have your tickets ready so when you go it's a virtually contact contactless experience uh get your movie concessions have them all waiting there for you walk right in sit down in the theater which is at limited capacity obviously to keep you safe it's just uh, something that i enjoy i love the movie going experience i know if you're listening to the show you probably do too check out the website marcustheaters.com for more information right now we're going to head to our second guest Right now we're talking to Craig Allenson, author of the upcoming book. I guess it's actually already out now, Brush Fire from Expeditionary Force Series. This is the 11th in the series. It's available as of December 1st on Amazon and Audible. Craig, how are you? I'm doing great. The book actually comes out December 15th. 15th, okay. We had a, uh, yeah, we had a little bit of a delay because, you know, 2020 sucks. So. <laughs> it's been the yeah. worst year. Yeah, absolutely. So with this being the 11th book in a series... When you first took on this, uh, you know, going back to the very first book in the series, Columbus Day, did you dream that you'd be doing it 11 books later? I had no idea. I mean, I, I wrote Columbus Day way back in like 2010, 2011, and then wrote a couple other books and could not get them published. So in like the fall of 2015, my wife said, why don't you try self-publishing? Um, and she said it partly so that I would shut up about not being published. <laughs> um, and I published Columbus Day in January of 2016, self-published it on Amazon. And the book took off. I, ha I had no idea. And I had, I had plans for a book series that I probably would have written anyway. But, I mean, the success it's had has just astonished me. I just can't believe it. Yeah. And it seems like there's always a market for like that sci-fi type stuff, like uh, the the stuff that goes on in Expeditionary Force is something that's um, people always it sets the imagination off. So uh, when you're going through this, are you ever uh, obviously all writers suffer from writer block occasionally, but has there ever been a time when you're just kind of like you get stuck and you uh, you have trouble finding out where the story's going to go next? No. So I was a big fan of the TV show Lost. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it became obvious they had no clue where the story was going, right? <laughs> this is true. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I did not do that. When I started writing Columbus Day, I said, where did these characters come from? Where's the story going? So I mapped out a story arc for the entire series, book by book, and I have held to that. So within each book, I know what's going to happen to move the plot along and get it to the final book, 
which will be published around Christmas of 2022, so about two years from now. I I have a kind of a background in finance and, and software design. I wrote uh, code for financial systems. Okay. And I was talk I was talking to my fellow sci-fi author BV Larson okay, a couple of weeks ago, and his background is also you know writing code. And I said, you know, I approach each book in a series like a module in a piece of software where the previous book plot is your input. And then things happen. At the end of it, the plot has moved along to advance the overall story. And that's the way I think about it. But no, huh. I don't have writer's block because I had all this stuff planned out years ago. I'm writing an outline. All the way to the very last, like you know what's going to happen in the last book. So that means you do have an end where this is this is going to be the end of the Expeditionary Force book series. So you, you've got it all flushed out. You know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, as the writing process goes, like I said, my God, you're 11 books in. Nothing has ever popped up to kind of change your path a little bit or, well, we can kind of do more here and then maybe we'll go a few more books. It's been just perfectly plotted out and you kind of knew where this was going from the beginning with no change. I've had detours along the way, but the detours always come back to the same direction. Okay. The overall story hasn't changed. I've written the last two chapters of the last book. Oh, wow. I wrote those a couple of years ago. Uh, now, I imagine I'm going to tweak things a little bit just to change my writing style, but I know exactly where the story's going, and I've been revealing things all along. There was a huge, it was a huge reveal at the end of book nine that ended on four massive cliffhangers um, that revealed basically where one of my main characters came from and how the war got started and you know, why there are all these uh, blasted extinct planets uh, in the galaxy, all that. Yeah, so I did, did a big reveal there. Hmm. And with this being audio form also, we mentioned it's uh, available on Audible. Uh, Podium Auto is the one who released this in audio format. When you're writing a book, obviously when you started out, you probably didn't think, oh, this will be read by, you know, R.C. Bray at some point. Does it change your writing style at all, knowing that this is going to be narrated in audible book uh, as opposed to I'm strictly writing this for the written page or is there really no difference? No, I definitely write for audio. Okay. Um, I, so my writing style, to, to steal a phrase from John Scalzi, uh, it is heavy on dialogue, light on, light on description. I, I, I rarely go into describing things hard, let the reader or the listener figured out in their mind, but I'm, I'm heavy on dialogue to move the plot along. Um, I was blown away when Podium offered R.C. Bray to narrate the first book. I'm like, oh my God, this is the guy who narrated The Martian. He's going to narrate my book. My life is complete. <laughs> I, mean, I, I could not believe it. Um, and by the way, Podium Audio, my, my audio partner, I noticed this morning on Audible, in the U.S. rankings, they have number 11, 12, and 13 books overall. Really? Wow. That's impressive. Yes. From wow. Podium. And we're hoping that we're hoping that next Tuesday, my book will, you know, my book Brushfire will debut somewhere around there. That would be nice. Very cool. But yeah, I definitely write for audio. Um, it, it actually makes your writing move faster um, and makes the story move because like there are the other authors I know use so many dialogue tags. So it, when you're reading a book, it'll say blah, 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 Joe said, blah, 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 Skippy said, blah, 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 uh, Margaret said. Your eye skips over the word said there because you just get to the next line. But in audio, Bob is, R.C. Bray is reading it out. Blah, 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 said, said, said it's audio poison. Hmm. So I avoid those dialogue tags, right? or I put them in the middle of the sentence and it makes it for cleaner writing. And ah. now, now I hear RC Bray's voice in my head, that bastard while I'm writing the books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I will coordinate with Bob on, Hey Bob, I'm thinking of creating a new character. Uh, do you, do you want to do this voice? Do you have an idea for this voice? Um, Bob hates to do French voices for some reason. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I don't have any. I I killed off my one main French character <laughs> kind of for that reason. But the, like, for example, in one book, I had a young character. 
I wanted him to burp the happy birthday song. And I ping Bob and I'm like, hey, Bob, you know, first, can you still do this? Because I used to do it when I was a kid, right? Can you still do this? And do you want to? And he replied, was, dude, please. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely can't do it. I want to do it. It was hilarious. So that's, that's, I see, I would not have thought about writing for an audio medium. That's interesting. I mean, I'm not a writer, but I think that's very uh, interesting that I don't know if that's where writing's going or you just kind of feel like your style lends itself more to an audio type of format. My style definitely lends itself to audio, but I've seen a lot of comments like on, on author Twitter um, that people are moving towards writing for audio. It's hmm. a huge market, huge market. So that begs the question then, obviously, if the uh, the Expeditionary Four series were to be optioned as a movie series, like a Netflix or a, a Hulu special or anything like that, I guess, would do you have people in mind who you'd want to play main roles and things like that? Or has that not, have, have you not allowed your mind to go there just yet? I've not allowed my mind to go there. And uh, fans have asked, saying, you know, who would play Joe Bishop? Who would play Margaret Adams, et cetera? Or, you know, what do the Ruhar look like? They're kind of these rodent-like aliens I have. Or what do the Kristang look like? They're kind of a lizard-like. And I, I bet my answer is the Kristang look like whatever the art director of the TV show thinks <laughs> they should look like. Good answer. <laughs> That's a good answer. I don't want to say one thing, it turns out. So the, the series has been optioned by Podium Audio, and we're looking for a production partner. Very cool. Yes. And 2020 Although being right what now it is, with COVID, we're kind of, everything is shut down. Exactly. So people aren't even having meetings. So if you had to, out of the, uh, like I said, the the eleventh book, Brush Fire, is about to come out on December the fifteenth on Amazon and Audible. If you had to pick your favorite book of the series, would it be Columbus Day, just because that's the one that launched the series. Do you have a special affinity for Zero Hour or Armageddon or any one of the other books in the series more than another? And before we get that answer, we're going to take our next commercial break. So please stand by on geek to me Radio. Hey, hi, listeners. This is Greg Berger. Me, Grimlock, Dinobot, leader from Transformers. And guess what? You're listening to Geek to Me Radio. Transformers, for the we Welcome back to Geek to Me Radio. I'm your host, James Ensel. I never say my name. I always notice I never say my name, but my name's not important. It's the name of my guests I want you to remember. So thanks again to June Carroll. And right now we're talking with Craig Allenson, New York Times bestselling author. And before we took that last break, he's got this brilliant series out. He's got the 11th book released. So we asked him if he has a favorite book in the series. I mean, my, my favorite is my baby, Columbus Day. Okay. Um, but there are fans who say that they think Zero Hour is great because there's a particular scene in there that they love in Zero Hour. But I mean, I've had fans say that they love, they think the book I released back in August, Critical Mass, book 10, was my best book because it's got a real kind of a fist pumping, yeah, moment at the end of it. Um, yeah, Columbus Day, I'd say, is my favorite just because I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it for anyone else out there. And then Expeditionary Force Mavericks, uh, there's two books, I believe. I think there are two in that series, Death Trap and Freefall. Is it safe to call that a spinoff series, kind of? Yeah, it is. And I that is a detour. I did not originally plan for the Mavericks to have their own book series. They were going to be part of the main book series where they would go off and do their own adventures. And basically, I... I said, I've got too much story there. I can't squeeze it into a couple chapters of an X-Force book. So I spun them off and I have my own. My wife, ironically, she loves the Mavericks books. Hmm. She does not like the main X-Force books. Oh, interesting. Just, yeah. It's, and fans have told me, people out there, hey, I, lo I love the X-Force books. Uh, yes, but I love the Mavericks books better. The Mavericks books tend to be more hard edge military sci-fi, um, whereas X-Force is more space opera, I think. 
And for the uh, for the military know how, does there uh, do you have consultants? Who do you talk to? How do you get certain? Obviously, sci fi. You can kind of take whatever you want based on you know quantum physics and all these other kind of cool things out there. But do you have anybody who you is kind of like your go to on military stuff? Do you have uh, an advisor, if you will? Yeah, I saw friends and family. You know, retired military uh, stands now have chipped in with you know, hey, you got this right, you got this wrong. Um, the the book series is set say present day, so Columbus Day is next Columbus Day. Let's say uh, it's it's very real now not you know 24th century stuff Mm -hmm. so i use u.s military slang throughout but i started to invent my own slang because at this point the starship crew would have invented their own slang right yeah sure it's been so many years that they would have their own slang and had their own experiences out in space and so, as we discussed earlier, you you have an end point in sight. You know how this is all going to wrap up with some possible tweaks. Let's say this is uh, this is over expeditionary force. Obviously, I assume you'll continue on with the Maverick series. But is that going to kind of leave you like, oh, I kind of miss <laughs> writing the expeditionary force series? No. Do you already have new plans in mind, or are you kind of going to be glad to be yeah. finally moving on to a new project? No. So. The Maverick series is over. The, the two books. Oh, just two. Okay. There was a there there was going to be a third Mavericks book, but I was talking to Podium, and they said, "Well, what's the the action in there?" When I broke it down, I realized, well, it's mostly about the Mary Band of Pirates, the X Force. So the book I'm writing now, X Force Book Twelve, originally was going to be Mavericks Book Three, and we said, "Well, because most of the action." It, it's both crews together, the Mary Band of Pirates and, and the Mavericks. So I've relabeled book, Maverick Book 3 as X-Force Book 12. It's the same story, just a relabeling. Okay. Um, but before the final X-Force book, X-Force 15, is released in December of 22, uh, I'm going to be releasing the first book in a new series that summer. And the second book in the new series will come out in February of 23. So two months after the last X-Force book. And I've already started writing that series. So That's a lot to juggle. So you're writing multiple series at the same time. I can barely like focus on two tasks at a time. That's amazing. That you're able to just kind of do you pop back and forth. You like have, okay, on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, I'm doing Expeditionary Force. On Tuesday, Thursdays, I'm doing my new project. Or do you just kind of when inspiration hits you, you sit down and start working. And once again, we'll stop to take our very last commercial break, come back and complete our talk with author Craig Allenson. Please stand by. Attention, maggots! This is Sergeant Slaughter from WWE at G.I. Joe, the real American hero. And you're listening to Geek to Me. Don't touch that dial, and that's an order. G.I. Joe. Welcome back to this final segment here on Geek to Me Radio. The show would not be possible without the support of the Greater St. Charles Convention and Visitors Bureau. That's the website that I've told you about since the beginning because this sponsor has been with me since I started the show going on a little over five years now and that is discover st charles.com discover s t charles.com check it out if you're looking for some place to go uh if you want to get out of the house i know now things are starting to open back up here in 2021 if you want to go visit someplace new there's probably not a better place than historic st charles with all these quaint little shopping uh, experiences and the different dining options you've got there just along that's just along south and north main street then you go back further there's all the historical buildings if, i always say if you're a history buff if you're a foodie if you're a shopaholic st charles has you covered on all these fronts it's just a great place to visit christmas traditions went off uh, a very modified version of it with everyone wearing masks social distancing but a great time was had by all and we got a lot of great compliments and remarks on how well We did this festival when a lot of places weren't doing festivals and shutting stuff down. It was great to have this. And if you're from out of town, 
please come and visit discoverstcharles.com. You can plan your trip, check out places to stay, kind of make a little list of things you want to do and visit while you're there because there's a lot to see and do. You can do it all from the website. And if you're here in St. Louis and you haven't yet been out to St. Charles, I encourage you to do so. Tompkins House for fantastic cocktails, salt and smoke. If you just want some nice food to sit out in the patio and eat, they've got the heaters and the fire pits. It's a great place on a slightly warmer day when it's obviously like 20 degrees, maybe not. But uh, it's just a great place to visit, no matter where you're from. DiscoverSTCharles.com is the website. Very glad to have the Greater Convention and Visitors Bureau of St. Charles as one of our premier sponsors. We're wrapping things up here in the show, and we're going to wrap it up with this final word from Craig Allens. And we asked him about how he stays organized when he's writing literally multiple projects. So I have a spreadsheet that tells me when I'm supposed to start working on a book, how many words I'm going to have to write each week, when I'm going to finish it. When I'm going to edit it, when it goes to my beta readers, when I deliver the manuscript, the podium audio, et cetera. So right now I'm writing the new series uh, in my spare time, basically. I don't actually have to start writing that new series until June this year, I think. But as scenes pop into my head, I write them down because otherwise I'll forget the chart games. (laughs) Um, Also, I wanted to get some feedback from some people about the tone of the new series because the new series is not sci-fi space opera. It's uh, urban fantasy. I think it's called. It's like, um, do you know the Dresden file series by Jim butcher? Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar. I haven't read it, but I'm familiar with it. And the bas- backstory. Yeah, so it's, yeah. It's, it involves magic on present day earth. So it's not sci-fi at all, but it's not high fantasy. It doesn't involve, you know, elves and orcs and dragons and all that sort of thing. Um, Urban fantasy is the only label I can think that people know. Okay. And then, uh, obviously, I guess you said you've got a spreadsheet mapped out with when you're supposed to be working on what. That comes back to that financial reports and the IT background, I'm assuming, where you're just good at making spreadsheets. That kind of is the way your mind works and organizes. Oh, God, yeah. Whenever we buy a car, my wife knows it's going to be three months to be putting spreadsheets together <laughs> before we go to a dealership. <laughs> but see, at least you're never going to get a bad deal in a car that way if you think about all the pros and cons ahead of time. So good for you. <laughs> yeah, we pretty much buy cars online, uh, used cars online, and we've always had a good experience. So, But, of course, I shop for three months before I hit the button. Nothing wrong with that. That, that, that saves you buyer's yeah. remorse, I'm assuming. Yes. And, again... Expeditionary Force Book 11 Brush Fire available on December the 15th, Amazon and Audible. You can also go to Craig Allenson, A L A N S O N dot com to check out his books. You can buy t shirts and stickers, all the cool merchandise he's got there. Are you on uh, social media as well? Twitter, Instagram, or anything like that, Craig? Yeah, Craig, Craig Allenson on uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook. Not Instagram yet. I need to get on Insta. Perfect. We'll watch for you to pop up there as well then. Uh, Craig Allen said, this has been great. Continued success to you. Good luck on everything. And we'll look forward to checking out Book 11 Brush Fire when it hits Amazon and Audible on December 15th. Thanks. Hey, I was uh, when I was running yesterday, I was listening to your podcast about superhero ethics. Yes. That was a really interesting episode. Yeah. Yeah. They, that was a, an author wrote that book and uh, they someone reached out and said, would you be? I'm like, that's like incredible. I think it, I've never kind of approached it and I've got a degree in psychology. So uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Though. I appreciate that. That was uh, that was a fun episode. Yeah, it got, got me through a really tough run yesterday. So okay. thank you about that. <laughs> no problem. And was there anything else that we didn't mention or touch on that you wanted to uh, make sure we mention or I can go back and edit in? No, no, it's uh, great. You, you, you hit all the, the, the high points and yeah. Perfect. It's, it's been my, this has been my, you know, self-publishing journey um and now i'm now i'm a hybrid author because podium hands my audio and i self-publish the ebook and the uh and the paperbacks it's you know it's a where the industry is changing so rapidly right now I, even the podcast industry i mean people are buying up podcasts now because they're just desperate for content right yeah that's what i, I keep seeing i'm i'm coming from a radio background so that's uh the podcast you know i get it and everything like that but i it's uh i do have that love of having a live radio show uh, where people can call in and stuff like that. When uh, obviously yeah. COVID's a little bit changed things up, but <laughs> it's, it's still, yeah. Uh, yeah. When, you know, people, people like to interact. And I think uh, things like that and the zoom calls, thank goodness for technology and allowing people to still be able to connect and things like that. Oh God, I, I appreciate zoom. It's like, Oh my God, another human I'm talking to. Right. 
talk about the self the self publishing. I guess that's uh, that's kind of nice. I guess from an author standpoint, because you don't have anyone else coming in saying, "No, you can't do that," or "Well, don't do that," or yeah, I guess you've got more control and creative ownership and everything of of your properties. Oh, that that is huge. Uh, look, for example, my books. The very first book, Columbus Day, was like one hundred and seventy thousand words, I think. And on average, I go one hundred and eighty to one hundred and ninety thousand words. There is no way if I had a traditional publishing contract, they would allow me to do that. Huh. I mean, epic fantasy. If, if you're like Brandon Sanderson writing epic fantasy, you can get away with a quarter million word book. But if you're writing sci-fi space opera, 110,000 words is really pushing the limit on there because traditional publishers are mostly focused on, on the print book and they want to keep down the price of that print book, right? Uh, so they want okay. not to have too many pages in there. And, you know, it'd be, you know, cut this and cut that. And they're like, no, I'm publishing the, I basically write the kind of books that I want to read. And I am very fortunate that other people also want to read those books. Yeah. I don't know how to write anything else. Yeah. yeah they, they always say but if you're we're... writing, creating what you love, there'll be someone else out there who will love it just as much, but very cool. Congratulations to you. And, uh, yeah, Thank if you. there's anything else down the road that, uh, that comes up, if you're, Wanting to, whenever your new series comes to fruition, if you want to uh, talk about that on, on the show, we'd love to have you back. Good deal. Thank you very much. That's going to do it for us. Another episode in the books, number 201, done. Uh, my thanks again to my guests, June Carroll and Craig Allenson. Thank you to Joey V for doing all the work behind the scenes to make the show sound as good as it does. And I want to make sure you subscribe on Patreon to hear full interviews. Some of these I've got to edit down to get them in the time frame. So make sure you subscribe on Patreon. You get access to the full unedited interview. We have a brand new website, geek2meradio.com, coming next month. So make sure you check that out. We'll talk more about that when it drops. And until next week, my friends. It's not in the way you watch I sound. Twenty twenty one. Good night. Hi, this is James Enstall, host of Geek Me Radio, and in honor of my favorite Themyserian, I've decided to become an Amazon warrior. Harrod, give me strength. The next time you want to buy something from Amazon, go to geektomeradio.com first and click on our Amazon affiliate link. Simply shop like you normally would, and when you check out, a small percentage will go towards supporting the show. So remember, the next time you want to search Amazon for the latest Wonder Woman graphic novel or parts for your invisible jet. <laughs> Click through from geek 2 me radio.com first. The world was in peril. Would you have me stand by and do nothing?